<laughs> We're going to get started. No, sorry. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you for joining us today for another lecture in the Central Eurasian Studies Summer Institute's 2022 lecture series. For those of you who do not already know me, my name is Sarah Linkert, and I am the SESI Program Coordinator. The SESI Lecture Series is an extension of the Krika Academic Year Lecture Series with a special focus on Central Eurasia. If you are interested in more events like today's, please check out our website, event calendar, or pick up one of our printed event handouts over there, I think. <laughs> Um, also, please do sign in. I know we forgot to bring the sign-in sheet last time. Um, we're going to make sure it gets passed around and everyone signs in this week. As always, I would like to start by thanking the 14 regional and area studies centers across 10 U.S. institutions that compose the SESI Consortium for supporting our institute and making events like this possible. As a note, this event is being live streamed and recorded for our distance learning students. Therefore, it is possible that as live audience members, your voice or image may appear on the recording. If you do not want to potentially be recorded, please sit in the back of the room and save any questions or comments until after the stream has ended. Our speakers today are Dr. Amanda Wooden and Henry Misa. Dr. Wooden is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Dr. Wooden received a PhD in International Relations and Public Policy from Claremont Graduate University and a BA in Russian and Political Science from Syracuse University. Her research explores environmental policy, water politics, extractive industries, climate change, nationalism, protests, emotional political ecologies, and environmental justice in Central Asia and the United States. Her work has been published in Post-Soviet Affairs, Political Geography, PS, Political Science and Pol Politics, Central Asian Survey, Ab Imperio, and various edited volumes. In 2017 and 2018, Dr. Wooden served as president of the Central Eurasian Studies Society. She is a 2018 current Fulbright Global Scholar, conducting research in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia, following the political and cultural lives of Tian Shan mountain glaciers over time. Henry Misa is a PhD candidate at the Ohio State University Department of History, specializing in pre-modern Central Asian history. His dissertation research focuses on socio-ecological relations and resource utilization during the medieval climate anomaly. He is also an alum of both UW-Madison and of SESI. So welcome, Amanda and Henry. Okay, is the, is the mic working? Can everyone hear? Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, we, will get, we have a lot of material to get to, so we'll just get started here. Um, before we dig too far into um, uh, the uh, history of climate and environment in Central Asia, uh, I just want to kind of emphasize that this is sort of a um, sussy self-pollinization kind of uh, um, event because um, and I just want to thank real quick my teachers from 2017 and 2021, um, both Loewo and Muhabat. They're, they're not here, no one's studying Tajik, but um, many of the topics related to environment, actually, um, they did include in their courses as well. So some of my interest in the modern environment and some of my understanding of modern environment is directly derived from um, my coursework at SESI. Um, so today I'm going to briefly try to cover four different topics, um, somewhat unevenly. Um, so kind of go over some of the general mm, technical language related to climate change. And then I'm going to give about 2,000 years of Central Asian climate. And then um, I'm going to touch just briefly on some of the ways that historians have thought about climate in the, with only, unfortunately, just the medieval period. Um, and then the fun part, which is the case study at the end, we will kind of look at the Karahanid dynasty and Karahanid state, Karahanid Khanate, whatever you want to call it, um, and how it was able to actually adapt to the medieval climate. So um, yeah, let's get, let's get the kind of annoying stuff out of the way. Um, so the first real key that we need to differentiate between is what is weather and what is climate. Um, so weather is much kind of short term, minutes to months. Uh, whereas the climate is kind of an average over many different years. So there's 
usually they're saying about um, uh, 30 years is kind of an average. So we're talking about shifts in the general average conditions. Um, and so uh, just to kind of zoom in on this a little bit, when we're talking about changes in the climate, we're talking about changes in the average. Um, but as you can see here, this is a image that Professor uh, Matthew Saltzman uses. He is a professor of earth sciences at The Ohio State University, seen here in his natural habitat. And um, so the point is, is that even when in a shifted climate regime, you can have uh, colder conditions, even if the entire regime has shifted to uh, a kind of warmer average overall. Um, and of course, this is one of the things that climate change deniers are uh, particularly interested in. Um, the next kind of technical thing that I want to just get out of the way is what is forcing. You might be wondering what forcing is, if it's related to the force. Um, this will depend on your cosmology, but um, for the purposes of this uh, talk, I'm going to define forcing as we do in the um, uh, Pilgrave uh, Handbook of Climate History, and that is forcing is, quote, a driving factor that is considered to be external to the climate system. Uh, end quote. And so this can be volcanoes, eruptions, this can be changes in the sun. Um, the plate tectonics isn't going to matter so much for our periods that we're going to cover. Um, but anthropogenic emissions is also a type of forcing. Um, and that's going to be kind of a really important distinction between what are the factors that are actually driving the climate system. And so um, along with that, uh, the last thing I want to kind of differentiate between is pre-modern non-anthropogenic climate change and modern anthropogenic climate change. And this is kind of a uh, kind of a busy graph that Professor Brooke came up with in 2020. I don't know if this clicker thing is working. I guess I'll just stay over here. Um, so anyway, um, what you see here is pretty much uh, the first half of the graph up until uh, this kind of blue spike at the end, this is the forcing that causes natural climate change. And then um, what we see over here in the kind of um, far end, the um, so pretty much on the left side, this is the natural forcing. So we have forcing from volcanoes and also from, um, so precession and uh, the orbital forcing as well. And then at the end, we see that this increase in uh, greenhouse gases, that is kind of anthropogenic forcing. So when I'm talking about climate change, it's going to be mostly the kind of natural variety uh, where um, the majority of the forcing is coming from uh, solar and volcanic factors. And then when Professor Wooden talks about climate change, it's going to be almost entirely anthropogenic in its regard. And so when this graph was made, the, actually the, it was, there was less carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. So we have an, in, that line should be a little bit higher, in other words. So um, there's a few other technical things that we may need to go back to. But um, just for now, let's move on into the kind of uh, overview of um, climate change in, in Central Asia and environmental change. And so kind of one of the, uh, one of the first kind of main events or periods in, um, in uh, kind of what we call like late Holocene um, uh, environmental history is the late antique Little Ice Age. So this is this period between, um, you know, kind of the uh, 6th and 7th centuries. And um, this is a study that um, Ulf Bundgen and his uh, colleagues did in 2000. Um, 16, and you can see there's a significant cooling both in the Russian Altai, well, it wasn't Russian then, but um, and then also um, a cooling in the European Alps. So this regime has kind of been, uh, we're talking about global cooling, mostly in the North Hemisphere, and this has actually been connected with many events that you'll be familiar with from Central Asian history. So we have expansion of um, the Turk Empire and the uh, Arab Empire, and the idea is, is that this um, this so late antique Little Ice Age climate regime had some sort of um, kind of uh, effect on all Eurasian um, societies. And um, we desperately need more research about this. And I just want to uh, touch on some of our uh, evidence for the late antique Little Ice Age. These are three, two lake profiles and one um, peat 
uh, profiles that um, record this very interesting kind of early uh, latency to little ice age that is then um, it starts out very dry and cold and then it shifts into this very kind of wet and also cold regime between about 600 and about 800. And um, this is pretty significant because when we have wetter conditions, we have the change in different biomes. So we have pretty much the expansion of forests into the steppe, the expansion of steppe into the desert. Um, and so this has a significant impact on the bioproductivity of um, uh, a number of different regions. Um, so that all ends, though. So at around 800, we see this kind of shift in the natural forcing. So here, this is kind of a diagram we have there with, you can see originally those big blue bars kind of around, what is that, uh, right around 600, a little bit before 600. That's the late antique Little Ice Age. And then what you can see is the volcanoes take a break there, kind of where that shading is. And we call that medieval climate anomaly. Um, when we're talking about forcing, that is also, they call this the medieval quiet period. The reason they call it quiet is because there's fewer volcanoes and fewer variations in the uh, solar uh, irradiance. So um, this used to be called the medieval warm period uh, because in some places the temperature actually did increase. Um, but today, since it's so much more complicated, we call this the medieval climate anomaly. And we will be um, returning to that um, in a little bit when we talk about the Karahanids. Um, so you see they're a little bit after this period, but that's because this graph is showing you the forcing and it's not actually showing you the, um, the actual impact of the climate regime. To do that, we need to look more closely at what we call the archives of nature. So this is, um, we have peat bogs, lake, lake sediments, and uh, what we call dendrochronologies. It's a really fancy word for tree rings. So trees are growing, and they grow more under certain conditions and less under certain conditions. Um, so um, this is kind of a very, very brief overview of um, some of the uh, types of evidence that we use to reconstruct the medieval climate anomaly. And pretty much all of these studies record uh, an increase in dry conditions starting in the 9th and 10th centuries. And you might be wondering, why is there a geography there? Well, that is a medieval geography. And so one of the things that they do is they can actually connect medieval geographical sources with um, sediment cores to figure out you know, where different lakes were in the past as well. So that is also kind of a type of um, paleoclimatic reconstruction. Um, and uh, we, can, we can go back to that slide. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, but what I want to just kind of focus on real quickly is what's going on in Kashgar. So we have the soil pro um, profile in, um, from the Kashgar oasis, and we see this very interesting increase in, I don't know if you can read it from that far away, um, but this is an increase in ephedra pollen. So basically, the types of shrubs that are living in the Kashgar oasis change during the medieval climate anomaly. And one of the ways that we can understand that is by looking at the pollen that is in this uh, sediment profile. And so usually um, they do this between Kinopodiaceae and uh, Artemisiae shrubs, but ephedra actually likes drier conditions than both of those two um, families of shrubs. And it's, it's a very, very tough plant. So that increase in ephedra pollen tells us that we actually had a significant dry period. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us exactly when that dry period started. So luckily, we have these other records, like when I mean, you see like number four, number two, number three up there. So we have a lake record and a peat bog record, that's number two, and then also dendrochronology from Hoshi, that is the number three, the little trees down there. And they pinpoint this increase in arid conditions to about 800. Um, What's interesting is that it actually takes until the turn of the um, 10th century, the, around 900, for this arid regime to hit the other side of the Tian Shan. Um, and so here we have this kind of like a visualization of one um, dendrochronology from what is today Tajikistan. Um, and this is a really wonderfully located study because it is at an incredibly high elevation and it is part of the larger Zarafshan watershed. So what they're doing is they're recording how much water gets to the Zarafshan um, before all of the agricultural um, 
uh, economy starts to tamper with that. Um, so this is another kind of difficulty that we need to deal with when we're trying to reconstruct um, past climates as well. So this drought did end. Um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the next thing is the Little Ice Age. So um, the Little Ice Age in Central Asia is um, generally characterized by particularly wet conditions in comparison to the medieval centuries, and then also in comparison to the 20th century as well. And um, one of the things that's particularly fascinating about the Little Ice Age in Central Asia is the increase in moisture during the 19th century. And this is some research that um, Professor Millward did, uh, did um, already in the early, early, 2000, uh, early 2000s. And this is particularly interesting if you, let me just skip forward a little bit. Yeah, so here's kind of um, a general summary of about 21 different studies. And a significant number of them actually record the, the, the wetter conditions into the 19th century. And this is particularly fascinating for historians of 19th century Central Asia because there's a huge increase in agriculture in both Qing, um, Alta Shaher, the Hanate of Hokand, and the Hanate of Hiba. So in some ways, nature is kind of facilitating this with, by, with the last part of the Little Ice Age. And this is both, um, um, the, the forcing here is coming from volcanic eruptions um, and is also coming from what we call the Dalton solar minimum right at the beginning of the 19th century. So um, the good news, I guess, um, well, this is, actually, there isn't good news. The, the bad news <laughs> is that um, that Little Ice Age climate regime ended. At the, at the start of the 20th century. And um, that's actually already at a point where um, anthropogenic emissions have reached about, about three, 300 parts per million. So we're already kind of out of the um, uh, earlier climate regime. And so this is what's getting people worried about climate in Central Asia, because we have this kind of long uh, kind of uh, wetter conditions during the Little Ice Age naturally ending, and then so we're going into a natural drought, and then, of course, also this is the human-caused uh, warming, which then, as we know, actually increases even drier conditions in Central Asia. And so um, this really kicked off in about the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so that's just a very, very brief overview of um, roughly 2,000 years. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to rewind time and go back to the medieval um, period. and. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that people have tried to deal with this historically. So we're going to talk a little about, about the Ogus. So I put the, um, one of their coins there. A little bit about the Uyghurs as well. This is um, uh, <laughs> just one of the, one of the stellas from, just to get, get you kind of um, some visual representation of the, the past as well. Um, so one of the approaches that uh, people have used is to basically just ignore the natural sources and try to reconstruct medieval climate based on medieval chronicles. This is what Richard Bulliet did in his study. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail right here, um, but I will say that one of his sources is written in Tajik or transcribed into Tajik, and you can find it at the Memorial Library um, right here. That's the call number. Um, but um, so Basically, what he says is that there's not a medieval warm period. It's actually a medieval cold period, and that this causes all sorts of horrible stuff to happen. So this causes the collapse of the cotton industry in Iran, and then this also causes the expansion of the Oghuz into the Middle East. And so a number of people have kind of followed what he said and said that you know this big chill event, um, which we don't see in the paleoclimatology at all, this event had this significant causative impact on the you know expansion of the um, of what eventually becomes the Seljuks. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's really hard to use um, uh, literary evidence in that way because medieval chronicles are also part of these huge narrative structures and they have many different purposes. Um, <laughs> and so as you can see here, kind of sketched out in this little diagram, there are some red lights. And so a number of scholars have really called, called this approach into question. Um, so I mean, just, just to point out two of them, Andrew Peacock in the Great Seljuk Empire, he says not only was there not this um, uh, uh, cotton boom that Bulliet had invented, but there's also no kind of uh, big chill climate at all. And then Jorgen Paul kind of decided that um, actually climate didn't matter in those centuries and that we can use actually political factors 
to explain the expansion of the Turkmen and expansion of the um, Turkmen Oguz and then the, eventually the Seljuk family into the Middle East. Um, so, and then uh, uh, Austrian scholar um, Johannes Brecher Capeller has also kind of developed this discussion and um, at first he was very, very critical of Bullis and Ellen Bloom and their scenario, but then he has kind of rewinded a little bit and he's starting to suggest that there are some solar impacts and that also this drought has some sort of impact on history. Real quickly, the, this drought has also been discussed by another research team that is headed by um, Nicola Di Cosmo. And so this drought is particularly pronounced and uh, kind of right at the last part of the uh, Uyghur Empire in uh, Mongolia. And uh, in a certain ex to a certain extent, the Uyghurs were able to adapt to this regime. Um, they did that through trade and through building new cities. But <laughs> the horses that they were exported were terrible. And we even have a poem about it from the um, Baijuiz, very famous poet. Um, and so there's this kind of double situation where on the one hand, there was an adaptation, but this drought is an intensifying um, the conflicts of the Uyghurs with both the Kyrgyz on the one hand, and then also with the Tibet, and then with the Tibetans as well. And there's this really brutal war um, that breaks out kind of around um, 820 between the uh, Uyghur and the Kyrgyz. This is eventually what gets rid of the Uyghur Hanate in, in Mongolia. And um, so this war is actually happening in the context of a drought. So whether the drought is causing that war, it might. But what we can be almost positive of is that the impacts of that war are um, uh, increased by the natural environment due to this drought in, in, in Mongolia. So even though they were able to adapt to the first part, weren't really able to adapt to the continued conditions. And um, oh yeah, so um, you guys should all have the slides I, I, I sent to Megan. So you can go to these links. And um, Professor De Cosmo has many lectures about climate and also about Central Asia and uh, methodology as well. So you can just go directly there and kind of hear it from him. So I'm going to skip this this slide and we can go back and talk methodology. But let's go on to the case study. So. Um, we know that this drought is already starting kind of in the um, 9th century in Mongolia, and then it, by the 10th century, it is starting in Transoxiana and also in, um, uh, what, so like Transoxiana, what is today Uzbekistan and that, that kind of region. And this actually continues all the way until the beginning of the 13th century. So one of the research questions that I'm working on is what did the Karahanids do? And we actually, um, there's a different, there's a significant body of evidence that suggests that the Karahanids were able to figure out a means of adapting to this drier climatic regime. And the interesting thing is that they used some of the exact same techniques that the Uyghurs had tried in the, um, in the early uh, ninth century. And two of those are this kind of urban expansion in a particular region, and then also using diplomacy to increase trans-regional trade. And so here I've just kind of sketched out the expansion of Karahanid minting. So you can see the, the years there and kind of how they're expanding. That's some just pictures of their coins because it looks, looks kind of nice. Um, but so um, moving on to this first factor of urban expansion. So um, this right here is kind of a uh, mapping of some of the most important Karahanid sites. These were all administrative centers of the Karahanid state ruled by different uh, members of the either the Hassanid or the Alid family. Um, we don't need to get into too deep about the political history here, um, but these sites are at, especially these three um, right here, they are between about 1,000 meters and 2,000 meters. And this is very interesting because why would you start building new cities in the middle of the drought? This is kind of um, interesting. And the, the research, this is ongoing archaeological research about these sites. and. Um, they had not only ceramic production, but also iron production. Um, we'll get back to iron in a second. Um, and also an integration of both the pastoral economy, also with the kind of version of the agricultural economy that was adapted to higher um, elevation. And um, so these kind of higher elevation cities are um, basically expanding the economy into new regions. And what's fascinating is that there is some actual ecological basis for why this would work. 
And so this is some research that they did um, well after the end of the Little Ice Age during the Soviet period. And what they did is they went to um, the northern Tian Shan in, in, in what is today Kazakhstan, and they went through to a bunch of different grasslands and figured out how much biomass they were actually producing. When we're talking about biomass here, we're talking about grass, shrubs, stuff that animals can eat. And it's really fascinating that the higher elevation, what they're calling tall grass meadows, there's a long complicated Russian name for it there. Um, and um, what's interesting is that these higher elevation meadows are actually producing way more grass than the lower elevation meadows. You can see it's almost an order of magnitude difference. And then um, they also, they didn't record dry years at all locations, but they did re record a decrease in dry years at this kind of lower elevation. Um, so here you have some kind of period pictures of what it looked like in the 19, um, uh, 60s and uh, 50s and 60s. Now, this isn't exactly what was happening during the medieval period. This, these aren't the numbers that, right, so no one was measuring this in the 11th century. But this kind of suggests that under these types of conditions, this is kind of this relationship between the higher elevations that have a high productivity and the lower elevations that have a much lower productivity. So in that sense, it sort of does make sense why they would be building these cities at the higher elevation. Um, and, okay, yeah, that's kind of some technical stuff. So moving on now to trade and diplomacy, this is kind of another factor that the Karahanids were used to kind of expand the economy in a way that was not necessarily dependent on the sectors that would have been affected by the drought. And so one of our sources for this is actually the Kutad Gubibik, which is, uh, it's kind of like a advice literature type, long epic poem. It's, it's been called Mirror for, Mirrors for Princes, but um, there's some problems with that categorization. And um, this, it's basically advices to rulers, and um, it also emphasizes the importance of the pastoral economy and also the agricultural economy, but it also tells us a lot about what they were trying to achieve with trade. And so I'm gonna look at that part real quick. You guys who are studying Uyghur, you can read this. This is a kind of uh, two manuscripts of this, of this source. And, you know, you can see on, on that side it says uh, but they don't, not a single dot in the entire word because why would you need that? Um, so, um, but anyway, so to look a little bit deeper into this passage, I've connected with Kazakh and Uzbek vocabs as well, as you can see there. Um, and so this is pretty much about how you should associate with merchants and they talk, you know, all, this, all these wonderful things that you're supposed to do to them. Um, and there's a particularly interesting passage here that says, um, So like, this is Dan Cove's translation of that. So if the China caravan ceased to raise dust on the roads, how could all those countless kinds of silk arrive? Um, and so here, this is actually khatai. So um, we know from Mahmoud al-Kashkari that this khatai does not refer to China in the sense of that we would think of China. It actually refers to the Kitan Liao, who are ruling Mongolia in this kind of hybrid um, paramongolic uh, Chinese state um, that we will talk more about in, this, in a second. So um, the point is, is that this kind of this focus on uh, trade and having trade be the thing that presents you to um, the rest of the world. And the interesting thing is that when we look at the actual historical reality that's not in the literature, we see that the Karahanids are kind of taking this seriously. And what they're doing is they're expanding the trade networks into, well, they're, they're, first they're continuing the trade networks that existed previously. So this is this really famous trade between um, Central Asia, Juarez, and Bulgaria, and then up into the Viking uh, lands. So starting in the 9th and 10th centuries, this is a very well-established trade route. And um, so there's silks there, and then also tons of coins um, from Central Asia. And one of the interesting things that this is, um, so this is a map from um, Al Kashkari. And so he's writing in the 11th century. And what he says is that along that route, they actually established new cities. So that, those routes, even um, after the 10th century, these routes were actually um, causing an increase in towns in this kind of, um, Khwarezm type area that's a little bit up to the north of um, uh, where the RLC um, was at, at that time. Um, and so um, that, they're continuing that direction. There's also significant diplomacy with the Ghaznavid Sultanate in North India and also with the Seljuks in the Middle East. So 
The idea is to kind of keep those markets open. The reason they want to keep that open is because of this increase in trade with both China. So you've got the Liao in the north, and you've got the Sung in the south. And um, one of the kind of really fascinating things about recent car hunted history is that they've literally gone through um, and found every single envoy that they sent to both the Liao and the Sung. So they're sending tons of envoys to basically keep that trade going. And so you see some um, items there that were built in the Middle East and then um, translated. Yeah, that's what the, that's what, that's the paramongolic version of the, of the name of that state. Um, and we also have literary evidence for this, um, for this trade. Um, this is a passage from the Chidan Gorger where um, pretty much they're describing all of the trade that the, the Kitan Liao have with um, Central Asia and with the Islamic world. So Yutian Guo, the state of Hotan, this is, um, according to Dutorayeva, this is the reference to the Karahan state. You also hear, you see here the uh, Dasher Guo and the Xiao Shir Guo. So this Shir basically means the um, uh, Islamic world. So this is kind of explaining the trade that the Liao was making use of. Now they call it tribute here, but we know that that's trade. And um, amber is mentioned as well. And <clears throat> so Central Asia doesn't produce amber, but <laughs> the Baltic does. <laughs> and um, we know from Arabic sources that actually the Karahanids um, were particularly interested in the Baltic amber. And so here's this passage from Al Biruni where he's talking about. So they call this actually Al Rumi. So this is the Roman. They call it uh, they call it Roman amber. It's very it's very interesting. And the reason they call it that is because um, the the Arabs first imported it through um, through Constantinople, which the Arabs uh, through Byzantium, which the Arabs called Rome. So um, what's what's interesting here is that um, not only do we knew, know about two different types types of amber in uh, 11th century Ghaznavids, but um, this, uh, the Roman amber is preferred. And so when we see it, this is a, um, this is a Roman or Baltic amber um, from the Liao burials, we can actually be pretty sure that this is the Karahanids that were trading to it. So that's just kind of one illustration of this increase in trade during the, um, during, during the 11th century. And so the Karahanids were sort of the middlemen in that, in that trade. Um, so, Finally, I got here to the conclusion. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be done in a second. There's a very kind of whirl, whirlwind sort of thing, and we can go back to any of these topics during the um, uh, question and answer, answer section. Um, but it really, so bottom line, we have these shifts between a cold and wet, warm and dry, and then again, a cold and wet, then going into warm and dry during the 20th century, that climate regime. That's generally what's going on for the past um, 2,000 years. and. Um, it also seems like there's a significant body of evidence that suggests that the Karahanids were able to adapt to the warm and dry conditions during the medieval climate anomaly. And with that, we will fast forward to the late 20th century. <laughs> it's kind of time travel. Yeah. 
Hi, everyone. Um, to yeah, jump forward uh, to the 1970s, picking up from there. Um, first, let me just start by thanking Megan and Sarah, uh, Ceci and, and Krika, I get that, uh, for inviting me and their flexibility with my son's uh, Little League schedule. And to Muldir, Oskenbay, and Brett for uh, wonderful hospitality, and to Irina and Karen um, for theirs as well. And to Henry for uh, 2,000 years of history, too, as context. Uh, I usually have to provide a little bit of context, but that is the best setup I've ever had. Um, anything that I get into here, obviously, in the Q&A, we can get into more details. So I will skirt past some big issues, I'm sure, and uh, please raise them later. Uh, last week, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, a glacier collapsed in the uh, Jugu Pass and the Terskiala Tow Range of the Tian Shan Mountains, or Tenkir Tow, uh, in Kyrgyz. This is not far from the Kumtur Mine in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I'm not going to play the video. Let me just ask, how many of you have seen this? Only like three. But I'll play a little bit of it. How's that? Let's see if I can get this to work. <laughs> right. This was tourists, British and American tourists were videotaping this with their uh, Kyrgyz guides and they videotaped it. They are really lucky that they, they actually stood there because they were right behind these rocks and they were able to, oh, some people were injured but everyone survived. Um, and you'll see the panic in just a second. I don't know if there are any curses here. There might be. Yeah. So if they had been walking faster, they wouldn't have survived probably, or would have been very injured, right? Because they were just right at the at that spot. And this is, of course, now you know it's shared. Um, that's not working. There we go. Give me one second. It's been shared, you know, over a million, approaching a million and a half times. Uh, and uh, this is known because it's on Instagram, right? But this kind of thing is happening more and more frequently um, in places where people live uh, and depend on these glaciers. While polar glaciers form the iconic mindscapes of climate change globally today, they're actually distant from the lives of uh, the majority of people on Earth. Their scale is difficult to comprehend. Their loss both triggers anxiety and limits our comprehension of climate change already happening. With the use of polar glaciers and bears as the symbols of a threatened future, we engage in distanciation from climate change, both in terms of proximity and time. But in contrast, an estimated 250 million people live in the third poles that is, inland glaciated mountains like the Tian Shan, where glaciers are close and familiar. These mountain rock glaciers form the headwaters that supply agriculture, urban drinking water supply, and hydroelectricity. An additional 1.65 billion more people depend on these waters downstream. And these glaciers have taken on renewed political lives in recent years in many countries of the Third Poles, from the Himalayas to the Pamirs, the Sierra Nevada to the Alps and the Andes. In many of these places, uh, mountainous places, over many centuries, people developed awe-filled mystical and spiritual reverence for glaciers and the mountains where those glaciers form and move, along with everyday practical and material relationships. As Julie Cruikshank recounts in her oral history of indigenous peoples of the Yukon, Alaska, in her book, Do Glaciers Listen? With the last several hundred years of industrialization and global spread and dominance of Western notions of human nature, hierarchies, and separation, these glaciated mountain zones have become places and emblems of escape, exploration, and extraction. As Andrew Stuhl, my Bucknell colleague and Wisconsin Madison graduate, has written about uh, concerning the Arctic. The dominant, dichotomized, and relatively new anthropocentric Western understandings of glaciers and mountains have marginalized and subsumed many ideas of mountains and glaciers as animated beings with souls 
agency, influence, and importance in humans and others' lives. In what became the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic, larger scale mining took off in the 1960s, primarily uranium and then gold. Uh, the colonial domination rhetoric uh, such as was applied in the United States and in Canada and Europe to elsewhere in the world also was applied uh, in Kyrgyzstan regarding the extraction and manipulation of what were referred to as natural resources and increasingly to glaciated areas. However, today in Kyrgyzstan we can hear the political reemergence of a soulful glaciers worldview that challenges modernistic binary notions of a separated humanity and nature. This worldview competes with, of course, remaining ideas and echoes of Russian imperial exploration language, Soviet modernization rationales, and capitalist neoliberal instrumental views of the same geological bodies. So these renewed narratives, which are often referred to as uh, Tengriist or Tengrianstva in Russian, Tengirchilik in Kyrgyz, draw on practices from and imaginations of the pre-Soviet and pre-Islamic past as reactions to the damage wrought by industrial actions. Um, and much of the political conversation and conflict about glaciers uh, between these competing ide ideologies plays out in the contested mining sector. In Kyrgyzstan, this isn't about extractivism, oil and gas and coal, which uh, we have a lot of conflict about in the United States and a lot of other places. But opposition is really in mining, to mining in Kyrgyzstan has for more than 20 years centered on water pollution, water loss, response to accidents such as the 1998 Barskun uh, cyanide spill, and most recently through mining impacts from the now iconic glaciers of the Aksharak range, which I will focus on today. What's interesting in Kyrgyzstan is how this controversy over a gold mine seems to have triggered national awareness and public discussion about glacier loss and global climate change but simultaneously how the Quimtor mine exemplifies for geologists and mining companies a test case of how to extract minerals around the world as glaciers recede, how to further exploit the climate change which extractivism has created. Uh, anthropogenic climate change, to be clear. Yes. So these are the themes that I'm going to focus on uh, and I will not list them for you. Um, we'll, I'll get to each of these topics as we go through here. Uh, in, in combination with my Kumtor research, my current project research uh, goal is um, seeking to record and understand changing socio-culture meanings of glaciers and their political lives in the present and historically. And in the climate era, what, are the, what have been and are the meanings of glaciers in places where they are disappearing? So in this lecture, I will explain the gold mine's history and competing narratives about it in relation to glaciers, permafrost, and climate change, and explore what loss means in this context, including those things strategically lost, the attempts to make people forget or ignore uh, these changes, and activists and others seeking to make people see and remember. The role of images in this process is a central one, and in competing ways about imagining Kyrgyzstan's future. I derived this talk from a book forthcoming in the edited volume, Water and Culture in Eurasian History. Uh, this is just a list of some of the most recent literature scholarship on mining in Kyrgyzstan in case of interest. Um, I'm a critical political scientist uh, with my work speaking to the literatures in critical geography and critical anthropology, and a particular focus on emotional, what we call emotional political ecologies, which I think will become clear as I um, present. And this is related to the transdisciplinary literatures on new materialisms, post-humanisms, relational studies, um, in conversation with political economy work on extractivism, neocolonial extractivism, particularly in Latin America, by scholars such as Orkidi, Nusser, and Bagdel's study of the cryoscape, Jackson and the mineral nation of Mongolia, Kerry and Atal on glaciers and mining, and Kirsch on mining capital. Okay, so I'm going to weave throughout this some um, 
quotes from my interviews um, with uh, research participants uh, over the years. I've been talking to people about environmental concerns in Kyrgyzstan since 2001 and with a focus on water, which led me to Kumtur when more and more people talked about it, people who didn't live near Kumtur talking about its, their concerns for it. And then time spent with activists, especially in villages along the shore of Isikol, led me to study glaciers at the mine and, and everything I've outlined so far. In turn, I have uh, spoken to um, government officials and corporate actors and really interested in the dialectic between these groups and how they are responding to one another and shifting and changing over time. So this journal journalist, um, you can see here the role of images as central, right? When the satellite, when he first saw the satellite uh, image of rock waste on the tongue of the glaciers at Kumtur. Um, this is going to be, what will come through here uh, is not only the central role of images, but of uh, the relationship between nature and national identity, how people talk about that relationship in this case, uh, and various forms of movement um, that we'll see. One second, let me just see how I can maximize this screen. Anybody? There it is. And this journalist is responding to, in 2013, some of the um, gold mining companies. It was a Canadian gold mining company, Mining Comptoir, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, started dismissing protests as inauthentic, paid protesters, right? Environmental concerns aren't there. People just want to make money from the process. And I had been speaking to activists for some years and residents and hearing about their concerns. So I knew that that was um, an interesting representation. But starting to hear people shift, people who are not living anywhere near the mine, shift in their understanding is what got me really interested in images and the power of looking, actually seeing the site that is distant, very distant from any villages and anything that people can see. So you can see the roots, right? This is a satellite image, and one of the kinds of images that enter the political sphere, the public sphere, through media coverage um, of Kumtur. And this is uh, just south of Lake Isikul, um, close to the border with China. And if we zoom in, then um, this is the, what the, the site looks like. The mine, Kumtur Gold Mine, operates at more than 4,000 meters, 14,000 feet above sea level, the second highest gold mine operation in the world. It has been a large income earner for the country ever since it began production in 1992. The Canadian operating company Cameco, later purchased by Centera, gained the license to mine one year after the Soviet Union dissolved in 1992, an early result of Kyrgyzstan's neoliberalization. It became a disputed site after the, a Kumtor truck crashed into the Barskun River, not far upstream from Lake Isikul, and spilled uh, cyanide. The company waited hours to inform local government and the population, leading to injuries, which compensation for which has been fought for decades. So uh, ecological impact of the Kumtor mine and economic ramifications of closing or nationalizing it have dominated national political discussions in Kyrgyzstan ever since. It is the, also the only open pit mine in the world actively removing glaciers to access gold. And you can see that here. Um, only workers, executives, international financiers, it's an EBRD funded mine, na uh, national officials involved in licensing and regulating, some activists and a few residents knew much about Kumtor's mine impacts on the Aksharak Glacier Range up until 2012. And you can see here, this is someone I passed in a stairwell who said, I, have you heard what's going on? Um, didn't know what I did research on, had no idea. Conversations with her led to me understanding that her daughter walked, worked in the mining industry, actually. Um, but the role of images became so powerful that even not seeing them firsthand, but hearing about them, right? Hearing about what was happening and hearing about 
the view um, really shaped public opinion. And often I heard my uh, interlocutors express emotional, very strong emotional responses to images they heard or, or saw about. Especially interesting in Bishkek among middle class, upper middle class, liberal residents who, to that point, were uncritical of mining, um, weren't talking about climate change, weren't thinking about either of these kinds of interacting things. And in the few years before the pandemic, I increasingly heard from tour guides, residents who live near glaciers, hikers, farmers, and herders, how they're seeing the changes in rivers and glaciers and how it is worrying them. And also in the last years, maybe five or so years, artists and in turn now marketers have turned an eye to mountains and glaciers to visually express widely shared public concerns. And I notably also witnessed this in Kazakhstan and there's interesting uh, kind of parallels going on there during the COVID era as people are actually traveling to see glaciers, hiking near them in a large numbers for the first time when unable to travel outside of Kazakhstan, right, going uh, to nearby areas. So this uh, kind of the role of images and how people were talking about them led me to the methods that I, I won't get into in detail, but generally referred to as photo voice or photo elicitation. So I asked people to share images that capture their concerns about environmental issues. So I leave it very open-ended and broad. What does environmental change look like to you? Instead of me asking a set of interview questions, they take photos or share photos they have with me and they lead the interview. Um, and they name them and they describe them. And so I'm not bringing my notions in of what might be of interest to them. And I'm not saying, hey, glaciers, what do you think? Do you think they're important? Oh, of course. I see if they bring up glaciers. I see how they tie in Kumtor. I see, do they talk about Lake Isukul? Do they mention Chernobyl or uh, Arauska Moria? And all these things come up in interesting and complicated ways, uh, often generationally different, the kind of discourse and language that people use. Uh, and so uh, this is, yeah, let me, Fast forward here. This is just an example of at the World Nomad Games. Uh, I was invited to um, speak at the Mongu Ethnic Echo Film Festival, which is really interesting. That was advertised all over Bishkek for probably three weeks um, with the word glacier, 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 you know, repeating over and over again. And everyone was talking about it. It's fascinating, right? Just um, that simple, and the symbols used, um, how that resonated. But while I was there, too, talking to residents near the area and their reaction to the World Nomad Games and the damage to the pastures, but also to what was happening in the mountains. Here's an example uh, in Aloto Square of the Mongu <laughs> advertisement. So this is a political science professor I've spoken to many times over the years who really isn't interested in environmental issues, as many political scientists maybe think it's in the past have thought it was not very important. My entire career has been spent trying to convince many of them otherwise. Uh, and in 2018 said to me, you know, I, I want to talk to you about this. This is what's happening. In the last year, people have been talking about glaciers, right? Everyone knows the names of the two glaciers at Comtour, the Vidov and Lisi. But people didn't care. They weren't important a year ago, which is, right, I think a really interesting harbinger of concern. Those aren't the only glaciers there. People did, were concerned about them, but now it matters to political scientists who are interested in what matters politically, right, at the national level. Okay, so to give you a little bit of a context on climate change, this is so far just kind of what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, an introduction to the issues. Um, and uh, this is really, what I'm focusing on here is glacier decline, right? So. Glaciers in both the Pamirs and the Tian Shan have recorded steady declines on average by 50% since the 1970s, varying considerably by elevation, uh, size, et cetera. And all the research indicates that, or a lot of the research about the region indicates clearly that it will reach what is called, at, what is referred to as peak water between 2020 and 2040. There's some newer research that narrows that down a bit, uh, obviously. Uh, pretty uh, sooner rather than 2040, it seems. The decline in the glaciers here is about four times as much as the global average. Sorry, four times. I said that correctly. 
At this pace, half of the total glacier ice volume estimated to be present in the Tianshan today would be lost by the 2050s. This is Sorg et al. in 2014, observed that even in the most glacier-friendly scenario, glaciers will lose up to two-thirds, or 60%, of their 1955 extent by the end of the 21st century. And this is important in all sorts of ways, but very important for the entire region is that it is a glacier-dependent hydrological regime. And Kyrgyzstan is at the top of the water column uh, in many different parts of the region, but in Kyrgyzstan, agriculture and animal husbandry, which depend on predictable water availability, availability are, are actually the largest portions of the economy, not mining, uh, and often in conflict with mining in rural areas. So these have long been a major worry um, here. So one thing that, um, one of the reasons why that video to me is important, other than the use of Instagram and images, is, is tourists. I've been talking to tour guides for a while now, just interested in places that they visit regularly that many people don't get to see and what they've experienced, how they talk to tourists about this and how, what, what happens with that. And can you, you can see here that um, this is something on, on, on their minds as well. So um, in these satellite images, you know, this is, we think about uh, monitoring stations, satellite imagery used to evaluate what's happened in, glaci in glaciers over time. But the people I've spoken to indicate in the rural mountainous areas of Kyrgyzstan that people's life experiences are making them realize climate is changing, even when they don't discuss it in those terms. Often kind of surveys, public opinion surveys, dismiss concerns about these issues. Well, people don't use that phrase, global climate change, right, or anthropogenic climate change, but they're talking about, hey, the river is siltier, right? Um, I'm not, things aren't growing as well. They're talking about this in increasingly. And so what we see here then is the connection. The next thing I want to talk about is how people came to an understanding and awareness of climate change via the Kumtor mine. So Kyrgyzstan contains 47%, uh, contains is a weird word, 47% of the glaciers in the region are within the current territorial boundaries of Kyrgyzstan. And it interacts with mining here, as I mentioned, directly through the extraction of ice ore, also through the use of a major industrial activity in a glaciated uh, region. Glacier decline and retreat in the Aksharak has happened, uh, has um, uh, reached about 8.6% or more due to climate change, at least it did from 1977 until 2003. Um, and the research is coming out soon about um, updated figures. So this, though, is the Petrov Glacier and Petrov Lake, which is right next to the mine. You can see the mine over there. Most people don't know the name of this glacier because the dumping happened at the mine on Davida van Lissi. But Petrov Lake, is the large, Petrov Glacier is the largest glacier in the area. And you can see here since 1957 how much the lake has grown because of the melting of Petrov Glacier. And what's really important for this interaction with the mine is that this is an ice dam that keeps that lake blocked here. And downstream is the Petrov River, or what was the Petrov River, which has been diverted into pipelines out of the valley so that the Kuntor Operating Company, starting in 1997, could put their tailings pond in the valley depression. So now we have a high risk for gla glacier lake outburst flood, a GLOF, here just above a massive tailings pond um, where cyanide leachate uh, from the mining process, from the extraction and processing of gold uh, is. It's a, it's a real major risk. Uh, right downstream of the Petrov River, Petrov runs into the Narin River. So um, I'm going to just skip this a bit. I come back to it, just the kind of some of the Soviet narratives that I've heard um, echoing in neoliberal narratives about the region. I'm happy to talk about that more a little bit later. So here's just a brief outline of the development of the mine. 
Um, and what happened in, really in the last year is the culmination, a nationalization process that the Japarov administration initiated. Um, and the board of Sentara, sorry, the shareholders of Sentara in five days will vote to approve an agreement with the Kyrgyz government to nationalize the mine. And so let me explain a little bit how we got to a major, expensive, valuable gold mine producing um, at times approximately 12% of GDP for Kyrgyzstan to nationalization in a legal agreement uh, with this um, company. Here we see uh, just some of the images of what has, what since the 1970s, uh, this is a, obviously pre-mining uh, 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 image, what the glaciers look like and what they look like after mining. There's one glacier, small unnamed glacier that was completely removed when the pit was created. And you can see the extension here uh, of the mine pit uh, over time. What's really important is um, that in order to save money, not only did Comtor Operating Company remove glaciers, remove ice, and continue to remove ice in an active process, but they dumped the till on top of the glaciers in order to, to um, damage the glaciers, melt them, you know, not have to remove as much um, by trucks. And, but what happened was the Davidov Glacier reacted in that it started surging. And it surged, it was moving at four meters a day forward, started taking out buildings at the mine site. And um, what's really quite fascinating about this is the different ways in which this was discussed by geologists at the site and by residents and people who become concerned about the issue. This is the back wall of the Kumtor mine from a visit I made in 2013. So in 2013, images of the rock waste dumped on Davidov Glacier became popularized by activists in the country. This image then appeared in all sorts of um, materials and elevated the conversation. So satellite images and this, these photographs, people who really weren't at all concerned, as I mentioned, started talking about this, right? The irresponsibility of this, the public anger And of course, there are lots of other issues related to the mining. This is a kind of a, a chemical truck that comes through Barscoon Village, or comes just outside of Barscoon Village through the valley constantly. Um, it's the first half of the day and the end of the day that people have to deal with. In 2013 wasn't the new period, wasn't the only time there had been activism. Erkin Gul Mankanjoeva, who is an activist, um, started mobilizing after the cyanide spill uh, she became an MP because of her activism, and she sought to get a law passed in Parliament, the Law on Glaciers, uh, in 2014, which would have banned all mining and glaciated areas. But the president, uh, Atambayev at the time, who was in her party, chose to not sign it into law. It passed Parliament, which was extraordinary, and did not sign it into law. And so we see this wave and wave of generations of activists uh, mobilizing about Kumtur. And what I started to hear after 2013 was uh, a different way of talking about the glaciers. Certainly young people are talking about what motivated them to be involved. But this process of um, kind of seeing the images and talking about the glaciers in animated ways started to emerge and be part of political discussions. At the same time, nationalist politicians started to co-opt the issue of Kumtor and discussions of what to do with it and argue for nationalization. Uh, so you see here Kamchebek Tashiev, who is right now the head of uh, national security servicing in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and using that same image of the rock waste on 
on Davidov a glacier. And glaciers became the focus of activism uh, after that period. But engineers, here is uh, standing on the edge of the pit with engineers uh, and uh, waste specialists, really talked with pride about the technologies of, that they were able to not just use, but develop at Kumatur, right? The great pride at creating this kind of site. So in essence, the glaciers were engineered to allow mining. So while engineers are talking these ways about the glaciers, people in the nearby area and nationally are talking about the glaciers as crying, right? They're talking about um, the glaciers getting angry at the response, that the surge was what you know, the Kumtor mine brought on themselves. And this, just to be clear, this is not people who are all opposed to mining. These people have mixed feelings, right? Who, people who have family members who work at the mine. A worker was the first person who showed me images of the damage on the glacier be right before it broke nationally because people were seeing it and concerned. So maybe do, as you can see here, let them work, let them mine, but not damage the glaciers, right? And a lot of this connects to um, this idea that I mentioned in the very beginning, this revival uh, of what is referred to as uh, the worldview in part that involves recognizing a soulfulness of nature and of agency and a political role. So, and I see this, I've heard this echo time and time again uh, with people I was interviewing who were activists and local residents and in increasing ways. I'm going to just uh, um, summarize. I'm two minutes over our agreed time, I think, here. So I'm going to summarize with a little bit about nationalization. Because of the co-optation of, of the ideas, the, the importance of Comtour, um, the need to reclaim it, what happened in this conversation and some of the activism was stop damaging the glaciers is what residents and many people in Kyrgyzstan talked about, and nationalist politicians argued, well, it, these glaciers are ours, right? They're national glaciers. And so if there's going to be damage and we're going to bear the costs, at least we should gain the benefits from them. This is, again, World No Man Games opening ceremonies, um, so these, the ubiquitous glacier images and chingis. Uh, so last year, uh, the Japar regime seized the mine in temporary nationalization. Arguing for the protection of the glaciers, they did this. And it's been going through an arbitration process for the last year. Uh, and what's very important about this arrangement is that, and Kyrgyzstan, and they've made this agreement, right, in April, just going to vote on it, it probably will pass, is that Sentara, the Canadian mining company, is indemnified from all Future costs, all current court cases for compensation for the cyanide spill have been canceled. They will not have to recultivate the mine. They set up a small recultivation fund, but they escape all liability. And if the mine has not been closed, now it's operating under the Kyrgyz Altin State uh, Gold Mining Company's um, uh, power. And so um, I think the, the importance here to think about, right, is um, when I talked about movements earlier, that theme of movement, glacial movement, we think about that as slow, but it's also about speed, right, in, in this instance. But policy change is glacial often. Um, glacial time is deep or lithic time, as Cohen calls it. Uh, Cohen in this, the book Stone, and Ecology of the Inhuman. It's used to describe slow and steady movement, yet when um, we try to change glaciers, uh, they become angry, they move fast, and society must change in response. 
So the question I'll leave you with is, can impending loss of this magnitude change a society fast enough? We know that climate change is being driven not primarily by what's happening in Kyrgyzstan, but what's happening here. So I'm not talking necessarily about society in Kyrgyzstan changing. Thank you very much.